The regular meeting of the Board of Education for November 28th is called to order. Every Welcome to everyone who's present. Um, this evening we're holding our board meeting at Jefferson High School as part of the new board's commitment to hold a portion of our meetings um, out in the community versus at the school uh, district's administrative headquarters. Um, so we're here at Jefferson, also known as the School of Champions. Uh, it was opened in 1908 and for the past 109 years, um, its students and alums have added richness and diversity to our our schools to our school systems and our city's life um, so I want to thank you to the Jefferson community for welcoming the board superintendent Guerrero and the broader community into your school this evening for tonight's meeting any item that's been voted on that will be voted on this evening has been posted as required by state law this meeting is being televised live and will be replayed throughout the next two weeks please check the board website for replay times the meeting is also being streamed live on our PPS TV uh, services website as a reminder, we have our PPS Ombudsman, Judy Martin, attending all our regular board meetings. Judy is in the um, back there with her hand raised. Um, specifically, Judy will be here to listen to the public comments and, if appropriate, provide additional support to families who want or need it. Judy can be reached at 503-916-3045 or ombudsman at pps.net. In addition tonight, uh, joining us at the board table is Elizabeth Large, uh, this evening's council. Ms. Large, uh, welcome to PPS. Uh, we also have interpreters with us this evening, and I'd like to ask them to come forward at this time, introduce themselves in the language they'll be interpreting, and inform the audience where they'll be located in the auditorium should anyone need their assistance. Do we? Are they here? Are they here? Are they still winding their way through the school? Should we, um, should we just go ahead and when they arrive, uh, we'll have them introduce themselves? There is a traffic down, sorry to interrupt. Really bad car broke down on this road. On this road, okay. I was going to say, or they could have taken 15 minutes to walk through the building like I did. <laughs> um, so when they arrive, we'll ask them to come forward and introduce themselves if somebody needs um, that service this evening. Um, so moving on to this, this kick off our meeting, I'd like to introduce um, Jefferson High School Principal Margaret Calvert. Um, principal Calvert has been at Jefferson for the past six years um, as the principal and in 2016 she was selected as the Oregon High School Principal of the Year by the Oregon Association of Secondary School Administrators and the Confederated Oregon School Administrators. Uh, this annual award honors personal excellence, collaborative leadership, and a principal's proven ability to ensure high success, high levels of instruction. Um, as a PPS alum and a board member, I want to thank um, you, Principal Calvert, for your service um, both to our students and to the Jefferson community. Um, so we'd like you and uh, I think you have some students here as well to kick off tonight's board meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Oh my goodness, okay, we'll try one more time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Jefferson. So there are a couple of things I just wanna um, share very briefly and then I'm gonna invite two of our students up. Um, two seniors, outstanding seniors that will share some of their experiences and what is unique about Jefferson. Um, there are a couple of things I just wanna uh, touch base and I wanna thank um, the school board for coming out to sites and bringing the meetings back into the community. Uh, we were uh, re reminiscing about the last time a regular school board meeting was here at Jefferson, and it's been a while. Um, there have been many listening sessions, but um, not necessarily a formal board meeting. So thank you for bringing the, uh, the meetings back out to the public. Um, and I also want to welcome uh, Superintendent Guerrero. That I think this is his third official time in the building. So welcome and, and keep coming back. We appreciate it. Um, and then also to all the uh, board of directors and um, for coming out and listening and being part and getting a sense and feeling what, what's happening in the buildings. Um, it is uh, truly a privilege and an honor to work closely with students <laughs> and with staff. Uh, the inspiration daily is palpable. We just had a, we were finishing up a staff meeting um, prior to the start of the board meeting and um, people were expressing gratitude and really ultimately the sense of community what it bring, means to bring people together, inclusiveness, the challenges that we face, how vigilant we have to be, and how we bring community together and how we reach across, uh, was uh, echoed multiple times throughout our meeting, but also um, it is demonstrated by our students on a regular basis. And what I know is that our students will lead 
if we let them. And so this evening, I'm happy to have two of our fantastic leaders who have been active at Jefferson over a number of years. They're both seniors. Um, if I could introduce Jordan Mejia and Javondre Cole, who um, and come up to the Diaz here, and they'll share some of their thoughts. Um, as I said, when we look at what is hopeful in challenging times, it is the voice and the face and the inspiration and the vision of our youth that lead the way. So please uh, give them your undivided attention. So hello, I'm Jordan Mejia and I'm a senior. And so my overall experience at Jeff has been very good. Um, you know, in high school, no matter what, you go through things, you grow, you go through things you don't like and that type of stuff. But I'm glad I went through all those things here at Jeff because I've had this amazing support system from all my friends here and staff, <coughs> teachers of that sort. And just the diversity here and the feel here is way different from any other schools. Um, I don't know, it's like we're one big family, especially since we're smaller. I feel like I can talk to my teachers more, and they're more open, I get more academic support, and I'm really grateful for that. And I don't know, that's all I have to really say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Javon Dre Cole, and uh, I am a senior here at Jefferson High School, my ex at the oldest high school in Portland as well. Um, my experience at Jefferson has been very remarkable, I like to say, but uh, before I get into it, I just wanted to thank you guys for seeing fit to have Jefferson High School host you guys' meeting today, and we're very thankful for you guys being here. Um, the School of Champions really resides near and dear in my heart because our history was very rich before I even got here, you know, in the 80s and 90s. We had wrestling teams that were state champs and state placers led by T. Von Abel. We had basketball program that was being dominant over the 5A led by Terrence Jones and Terrence Ross. Um, we have lots of other athletics here at Jefferson and the, and the history just goes beyond us. You know, our football team, our men's football team in 2009 that went all the way to state um, after starting 0-4. So it's just rich history showing that we are a school of champions before I even got here. You know, people before us like Silas Melson and Terrence Jones and Terrence Ross, like I previously mentioned. But even in the moment now, it's a lot. There, we still are continuing that rich history that we once possessed, and we're just trying to get that back. Um, just speaking on our athletics for a quick second, we've had uh, multiple people that are state champions and state players come out of here. Uh, Josiah Williams graduated two years ago as state champion. Um, Larry Brewster, our boys basketball team, most recently cr being crowned the 6A state champion. So our, our, our history is rich, and it seems that we just can continue to live, the, live up to our names, the School of Champions. But it's not always about athletics. Something that I mentioned a few weeks ago is that our students here at Jefferson, we like to use our athletics for, outs for assets instead of outlets. So we have student athletes is, is student first. So just to name a few of the people that have been here since I've been here in my four years, we have Jalen Gage, um, Morehouse, man, he committed to Morehouse my freshman year. Cindy Gregory, who has um, gone to MIT. Diagene Coley, who is now at Ho Howard University. Salim Yarbrough at Portland State. Um, Kahasia Burley at Clark Atlanta, who's our Rose Festival princess, wrestler and did it all. Amari Kazi, um, she's going to Tuskegee University right now, play basketball. And they were quarterback, soccer players, cheerleaders and all that but it's they use like I said the the athletics weren't that important because right now in college they aren't even doing sports they're doing school so that it was it's really important to know that this is just something that we do for fun and for commitment and to get to know each other that go to our school so athletics isn't a big part but it it really lives up to who we are in a sense and even most recently we've had people mm -hmm. such as Kamaka Hepa 
committing to Texas, Gino West, Idaho, Tiana, Tiaran, Suliana, Al, and Central Washington doing rugby. So there's just a list of names. I mean, Terrell West, Jeffrey Ward, Amari Stafford, Malik Parker. I mean, all these people who have, within my four years, have been my role models and people that I look up to because these are the same people that I walked the halls with, you know, shared, shared the same football locker room with. We were wrestling teammates, shared headgear, and it's really amazing and it's inspiring to see the legacy that they have built and they're really trying they're building something inside of me that's giving me something to look forward to for my for the people that are coming up and coming the freshmen and sophomores so the influence that they put on me is what's really making me want to do better and be a good role model for the freshmen and sophomores that are up and coming um, some of the changes I've seen at Jeff is of course our demographic um, it's really it put it's interesting because people take advantage of our program across the PCC. I mean, a program that will, I believe anybody should take advantage of that. So the demographic change has, has been something that's a big change that I've seen. But something that I do hope to see is that we um, can maintain this culture of community that we have been having since Jefferson was first open. You know, everybody knows everybody. Our student body isn't one of the biggest in 6A, but like I said, we're, we're together. And I can go down the hallway and name probably half of the student body at least, just because that's what Jefferson is about, and we know each other. Um, for I'll give Jordan a chance, too, after this. But uh, for future goals, <laughs> I'm planning on attending... Hampton University in Virginia, uh, and um, that's what, studying marketing or sports management, haven't decided, but that's what my future looks like. And um, I hope to study pre-med. Um, I've applied to 12 colleges so far. Um, I have three more I want to submit. Those are almost done, but my number one is Georgetown, and I'm just waiting on them. So yeah, that's my future goals. So between the two of us, um, I've, she, she already pointed out, but we have 18 scholarships applied to, eight acceptances. Um, we're very involved in our school, you know, with Black Student Union and student government, mm -hmm. cheerleading, football, Nationals Honor Society, a whole list of things that we're involved in, and we're just glad to be representatives of what our student body is. And we're, once again, thankful that you guys saw fit to have the meeting here. And um, as a gift for you guys for being here for us, we want to present you with these Jefferson High School water bottles so you guys can be official when you guys are walking around the community and let these people know who we are. So once again, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you guys with all your future plans. So Jordan, Jordan and uh, Devondre are um, very humble. And the, there are just a couple of things that they won't necessarily brag about themselves. So as they're, as they're handing things out here, both um, students are part of our health science biotech program. They actually were on a field trip up, up to OHSU today as part of our partnership with OHSU. They both are, um, have been um, active in taking classes at PCC, and they are part of our senior inquiry um, class. So all of our seniors take a capstone uh, project in class with, uh, in partnership with Portland State University, and they are working on uh, legacy projects uh, as well. And as you're, as you're hearing about how a, a big commitment from our students and our alumni is to come back into the community and give back. Um, it's, a, it's an ethic that has been maintained over well over 100 years at this point. So um, we see it in the faculty that come back. We have a number of teachers that were students here. We have um, generations of families that have come through Jefferson. And then there are always students that come back and find ways to give back. And uh, we expect that Javandre and uh, Jordan will do that as well. Um, the, if you walk down Center Hallway at Jefferson, there is a large um, painting on the wall that says, uh, what is your legacy? And there, are, and then there's some pretty prominent people that are <laughs> on the wall up there. So it's something to aspire to. But the, as part of what happens with our senior inquiry projects and our senior inquiry class this year, is that they are working at, in um, teams to determine some legacy projects of what what do they want to leave in the building. So we heard presentations today from a group about um, wanting to create. Um, some rooms where students can uh, decompress and re-engage in, into classes. We uh, are hearing students wanting to start clothing closets and um, figuring out ways to do pieces with um, artwork and displaying student artwork and, and being the curators themselves. So the rise of student voice and hearing 
um, how they come together is really a powerful statement. The, uh, Javandre talked about um, various student groups. There are a number of groups that work uh, collaboratively on a regular basis. So we have a Unidos group that is our Latino students and our president is right here, our Mauricio uh, Somineda. And then we have uh, BSU, our Black Student Union. Uh, we have a women's empowerment group, a straight, um, a, 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 it's not GSA, it's SAGA, which is, a, I am not gonna forget what the, it's a sexuality and gender alliance group. Um, and, and then there are a number, there's a multicultural club, there are, we have mock trial, there are a number of groups. But what is different, I would say, about um, how many of our groups interact is that they co-sponsor many, many events. So they, they will reach across and BSU will do something and then Women's Empowerment and SAGA will support um, and UNIDOS will come together for various things. And it's this ethic of inclusivity and trying to figure out how to reach across and understand each other it is just, it is the students, and I just will say this again, the kids are in a different spot than the adults. And we often operate from an adult vantage point, and it's just humbling to step back and watch what the kids say and do. And um, you know, these, are, these are two examples of students that just really step to the fore. So I'm deeply grateful to uh, Javandre and Jordan uh, for their contributions here at Jefferson and just the opportunity to work in this community. This is a place that um, is like no other place really in Oregon. And um, there's lots of things that happen in this, um, in this neighborhood and in the community. And part of what I'm really excited to hear tonight is that as part of the middle school work, so this is work that has happened for many, many years in this cluster in particular. I think I've been part of those discussions for at least a decade, literally, um, in various forms. And so it's exciting to think about how do we come and come together and really uh, lift the voices of both the community and students and come back to having conversations again and again about how do we create um, highly desirable programs for all students across the system. So I appreciate the, the dialogue that will happen tonight. And again, welcome and thank you for coming to Jefferson. Do you have any um, staff or le your leadership team that you want to absolutely. introduce? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So with us here tonight, I have uh, Ricky Allen is our, one of our vice principals. We have, we have actually, we're entering our 10th year here together. Um, we entered uh, Jefferson, wow. well, he was here before and came back. Um, but for the last 10 years, we've been working here together. Um, Neil Barrett is our athletic director. Uh, Michelle Otten is our school psychologist. I'm gonna miss someone. Laura, Ms. Belinsky over here at Laura Belinsky is our uh, health science biotechnology coordinator and is <coughs> an icon as well. Um, <coughs> trying to see if there's any other staff. I thought Ms. Thompson came in back here. Ms. Thompson is um, our health teacher and she has gone through a variety of things and worked at Jefferson, worked at the Young Women's Academy, came back and worked at Jefferson. So a number of years here as well. I'm looking to see if I miss someone. Someone has to, you have to wave at me if I miss you. I think I got everybody. Okay, so. Great, thank, thank you very much. And hey, way to represent. Um, I have no doubt that five, 10, 20 years from now, uh, when people are listing the names of illustrious alums, uh, your names will be on that list um, as um, alums of the School of Champions. So good, good luck this next year and um, in your way to college. And thank you. Um, in addition, um, before we, anybody else from the board wanna say anything? In addition, uh, we also want to recognize before we get started with our um, board meeting tonight, um, I'm going to call on Director Sparza Brown to recognize a um, student from Madison. Yes, we're very proud tonight um, to have a young scientist from Madison. Um, Cynthia Bui is here to tell us about um, her award as um, she was one of four high school students, pretty impressive that was invited to participate in a three-minute fast-pitch presentation to a group of entrepreneurs and researchers. So I think she's gonna come up and tell us a little bit about her project, and then she has a video to share with us. So come on up. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, and also I'd like to introduce her teacher, David Valenzuela from um, Madison. Thank you. How are you? 
So are we waiting? And I'm oh, sorry, and your principal, Petra, um, Callan, I know. It's late at night for me. It's been an early start today. Petra Callan is here to support um, our student, Cynthia. Take it away. I, oh, this is on. Okay. Yeah, um, I'd just like to say that I'm really grateful for to be here, and I'm really excited to share like my passion with you, which is definitely science. Our project um, has a really long title, but essentially the gist of it is that we designed a biological sensor to monitor water contamination and water quality here in Portland. And of course, as all things I like to do are, they're very locally based, but our project can be extended and applied to most certainly very many different situations here in the United States and even globally. So our project is, it, it's designed to really like address the issue of E. coli contamination specifically because our project was conceived uh, for a the PSU Innovation Challenge, which is an engineering competition ho hosted by Portland State. And so this project was conceived two years ago when we decided to focus on the theme, which was water contamination and water quality. And so one of the things that we chose to do was take a special twist on the prompt, if you will, because of the resources that we have at Madison with our biomedical program and just the leadership that Mr. V has showed in our program. And so we chose to do, we chose to genetically engineer and modify E. coli, a safe strain, of course, so that we don't perpetrate the problem. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we elected to do this so that we could inspire passion in the local community because science is something that I really care about and I think it's really important that we motivate kids and like have just our community realize that there's so much that we can do now as it is and this is where we're going in the future and so I'm really excited to be here to share that part of my life with you all. Thank you. And thank you for having us again. Uh, again, I'm Mr. Valenzuela, part of the biomedical program at uh, Madison. Uh, I just want you all to recognize that uh, Cynthia Bowie's project was uh, one of the few that were selected among uh, doctoral students, postdoctoral students, medical students, uh, master's level students all over Oregon. Uh, wow. What Cynthia conducted was cutting edge molecular research uh, that I did like when I was at Brown, like literally the molecular wow. logic uh, and trying to engineer bacteria. And I was just pretty darn fortunate of having a student and having students at Madison that are just uh, so engaged and uh, she kind of just spearheaded this project and uh, it's pretty amazing what she accomplished. So what's next for you, Cynthia? Um, I've applied to a few colleges right now. Hopefully I'll be studying molecular biology and biochemistry to, at either Brown or University of Washington and I hope to pursue a PhD in pharmacology eventually. She's going to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations to all of you, and we will be looking forward to hearing from what you do after your studies. Thank you, and thank you for having us tonight. Okay, so our project is titled A Genetic Approach to Designing a Novel Biological Sensor to Monitor so, Water Contamination, video. which is a really, really long way of saying we're designing a water sensor to detect coliform and other contaminants in water using E. coli as a sensor. So today is the Biosciences Conference. Uh, it's, in, it's specifically for Oregon. Uh, and there's a really cool event called Fast Pitch, which is from five to six. Uh, and it's where uh, applicants who got selected uh, pitch their idea on overcoming uh, a problem. Uh, and we were lucky enough to have one of our students uh, get selected uh, to compete with literally PhD students, graduate students, uh, master's level students. And so that's the challenge for us, to convey our ideas, to convey our concepts in a timely fashion so that it's understandable, but not overwhelming. However, in Portland, we do have an issue with the way we test for coliform and the way we test for contaminants. It takes about three days. And so in order to remedy that process, we elected to use the problem itself. We have a really um, amazing biomedical science program that I'm not really sure the entire Portland community understands exists. 
Um, Dave Valenzuela, has, he's built it from the ground up and he has really pushed students to engage in some graduate level work that students in high school don't often have the opportunity to take part in. I hope I that the, the uh, audience the and maybe even beyond that they really understand like this is the world that we live in now. We can do these things in public so schools with public <coughs> funding it, and that I, I want all my audience to understand that we live in the future. This is, these are all things that we can do now and it's only going to advance from here. I think, I think for Madison, especially for our biomedical students, it's seeing how much you can accomplish at the high school level. Before we move on to the um, student public comment, I think we have two of our, two of our interpreters here this evening. Um, if you come up and just introduce yourself, the normal practice. Добрый вечер, меня зовут Сергей Мельник, я русскоговорящий переводчик. Если кому-то нужна будет помощь, я буду в комнате сзади. Buenas tardes, me llamo Lucía Cabrejo, soy intérprete en español. Si me necesitan, voy a estar acá. Gracias. Kính chào quý vị. Nếu quý vị cần thông dịch viên người Việt Nam, xin quý vị sang mé ở bên đây. Sẽ có thông dịch viên cho quý vị. Cảm ơn quý vị. Thank you. Um, before we begin our public comment period, I'd like to review our guidelines for public comment. The board thanks the community for taking the time to attend the meeting and provide comments to the board. Uh, we value public input as it informs our work and we look forward to hearing from everybody. A quick reminder that signs in the audience should be no larger than eight and a half by 11 and should not be held in a way that obstructs the views of others. And um, during the public comment, the board members and superintendent will not respond to comments or questions during public comment, but our board office will follow up on any board-related issues that are raised during public testimony. Guidelines for public input emphasize respect and consideration for others. Complaints about individual employees should be directed to the superintendent's office as a personnel matter. Presenters will have a total of three minutes to share your comments. Please begin by stating your name and spelling your last name for the record. During the first two minutes of your testimony, a green light will appear. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will go on. And when your time's up, a red light will go on. We respectfully ask that you conclude your comments at the time. Um, so we appreciate your input. And with that, I'd like to ask um, Ms. Hewson to call up the first two um, members of the community who signed up. We have Maria McClay and Jamila Singleton. Hi, my name is Maria McClay, last name M-C-C-L-A-Y. Um, I was at the last board meeting to talk about um, how we got rid of the historically underserved designation for special education students, um, and I'm here to follow up. Um, I, we're not going to forget. It's not going away. I don't know if anything has changed. We know that there has been some communication to parents, so that's good, um, but we'd like to know what else is going on with this decision. Um, and we wanna know that there's, there's help coming to our students because um, they, they need more. So we're still here, we're still listening, still waiting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, um, my name's Jamila Singleton Munson. And uh, first, I just wanna express gratitude to um, the Jefferson scholars who brought so many names of folks from the community who, um, to be honest, I heard a lot of kids who I know their parents. Um, and it's just nice to um, have 
those voices in the space. So um, I've come tonight as a concerned community member, um, a resident in the Zone 4 region, a former Gregory Heights student, um, a 97 Grant High School alum. I do not have children. However, I'm an educator and an advocate for e um, equity in my professional life with Teach for America. I step forward tonight because frankly, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because I'm not confident that racism is currently being challenged in this district. I know in order to encourage change though, we have to lean into discomfort, so here I am. What's being done to decenter the voices of dominant culture in this district at the decision-making table? Historically disadvantaged people have uh, few entry points to turn towards in PPS. The system was not created to serve us well. I know from personal experience at Grant High School in the 90s that PPS has a history of structural racism. We went through a PPS when our graduation and success was valued and resourced less than those of their white affluent peers. With the efforts of leaders and nonprofits like SEI, PPS has made strides in acknowledging the needs of diverse learners, and yet the disparate outcomes persist. Look here at our board, at the teacher and administrator demographics. The dominant culture voices here are the majority. My second question, white exceptionalism, which is a value of white supremacy culture, is deeply ingrained in the DNA of this community. What is being done to question your own understanding of how dominant culture manifests in our American public schools? What is being done on this very, very white school board to challenge your own understanding and socialization? Superintendent Guerrero, hello. Um, I joined the many that welcome you to Portland. It is incredible to see a person of color sit and lead our district. And as you sit in this historical building, I hope that you seek to win the hearts and minds of the demo alumni across the city as you have the access parents and other families who have come forward in the last several weeks. As I watched the well-orchestrated meeting from a predominantly uh, vocal white community um, as Access Academy was under threat of being closed, I wonder what similar type of advocacy could look like from families at Roosevelt or George, where the classrooms are overcrowded, where textbooks don't meet the language acquisition needs of students, or how there's excessive discipline problems for those students of color as well. I challenge you today, um, as principal, can I think you Calvert, wrap up your, your mm -hmm. last comments? Thanks. That you have a legacy to put forth, and I hope that you uh, build a legacy of inclusion. So, as you sit here tonight in this building, I hope you leave here thinking, "What is your legacy going to be?" That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kim Wilson and Tin Sitzma. <laughs> um, my name is Kim Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N, and I'm a proud teacher at Scott School. I'm here with two asks regarding the decision to cut 0.5 special education staffing at Scott, as well as three other schools, a total of two FTE. In late October, we were informed that one of our two learning center teachers was being moved half-time to Roseway Heights to cover a need there. After hours of aggravating digging, we were finally informed in an email from the director of special education that due to budget constraints, and I quote, we were forced to drop the consideration of historically underserved populations in order to properly balance staffing, end quote. This refers to the additional 0.5 FTE that we used to receive because a high percentage of our students meet one or more of the following criteria. Special education eligibility, limited English proficiency, free meal eligibility, identification as African American, Latino, Native American, or Pacific Islander. Many of our students at Scott qualify under multiple if not all of these criteria. To clarify, this decision was to cut specific staffing earmarked for students that have been historically underserved. I would love to speak to how blatantly this decision fails our students from an equity standpoint and how it is polar opposite 
of our district's frequently touted equity policy. But I can't due to the time limit. I shouldn't need to speak to them because they are glaringly obvious. Simply said, this decision was bad, and I asked that it be fixed immediately. Every day it continues, hundreds of students and teachers are negatively impacted. My second ask is about op open and honest communication. From the day that we were informed of this decision, I've witnessed dishonesty. None of the details were shared until my colleagues and I investigated and pushed for answers. We were left to inform students and parents. We came up against half-truths, and in one case, a plain old lie. Here's my ask. Seek input from teachers when students will be directly impacted. I'm not talking just TOSAs and administrators, but classroom teachers who spend hours with the humans that will be affected. When a decision is made, honestly and openly communicate it to the stakeholders, including students, parents, and teachers. Go to them and tell them the truth. If that seems too difficult, it's probably a bad decision. Respond when students, teachers, and parents reach out to you. I forwarded to each of the board members the previously referenced email from the Director of Special Education on October 27th. I received one response, and it's been a month. Thank you, Paul Anthony. Some may say that I'm asking for too much and we can't possibly afford that the resources that my asks would cost, but our district's recent history shows that your, when we don't do the right thing the first time, the cost is great. We must do better. Good evening. My name is Tim Sitzma. That's S as in Sam, Y-T-S-M-A. I'm a second year Portland public school driver in the special needs department. This is my fifth year overall as a school bus driver. We've been operating uh, without a contract since last June 30th. This tonight is an a effort to continue the conversation. You heard from my compatriot Beth, uh, last school board meeting. <clears throat> we are not only at a standstill, but we're literally frozen. Uh, we've had four or five negotiating sessions, and basically we are appreciative of the $1.67 across the board that was given last summer to help bring in new drivers and to compensate drivers that are, that are currently employed. But it's expensive here in Portland. And we have drivers that are single parents. We have drivers that are doing their best to survive. We've come up with proposals on wages, on type 10 drivers, on uh, other issues, some of which does not cost any money at all, and we've basically been told repeatedly, the dollar sixty-seven, that's what's available. There is no more. We're doing what, and operating at the behest of the school board. And <clears throat> basically, other than some minor language changes, it's the same contract we had the last contract, with the exception of the dollar sixty-seven. Our wage and benefits are not at the level of some local and national school districts and communities of the same size. We will be here this meeting and every meeting along with our contingent of transportation drivers over in the corner to help foster the communication. But to be honest, <clears throat> the negotiating team has operated in good faith. We want to increase instructional time and lessen the amount of time that kids are on the bus. We're here with our teachers, and they do excellent work. If you've ever seen a special needs student suddenly begin to get it. Students that are behaviorally challenged, and suddenly the light goes on. There's, there's nothing like it. Our senior drivers need longevity and wage consideration. Some of them were driving when I was in high school, and I'm middle aged. And yet they're not the old burnout drivers, they're the ones that are tutoring, Mentoring, helping, our type 10 drivers need consideration. Step increases and at least some sort of benefits because they save the district hundreds, thousands of dollars in taxis. I'm just asking to have your negotiating team operate 
in, I'll conclude my bet with this, to fair bargaining. They basically said, our hands are tied. This is all that the board allows us to do. And I implore you to communicate with them because right now we're waiting for arbitration. And that's no place to be. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we have Walter Hollins and Leslie Waldo. Okay. <laughs> you can decide between yourselves. Okay. All right. I'm Walt Hollands. Uh, that's H O L L A N D S. Um, I'm a teacher at Grant High School. I did my student teaching in this building in 1990, and I've been at Grant since '94. Um, and I've taught virtually every science class there. Um, I'm here to talk today about the new uh, freshman physics class that. Um, has been essentially imposed on all of Grant, uh, Portland's high school students. So ninth graders are now all taking physics. Um, and I'm not opposed to that. I've taught freshman physics in the past, and that's okay. But I want to talk about the curriculum that was adopted. Um, this curriculum was essentially it was free. It's developed by one teacher at Beaverton High School. Um, it, there's no book. Um, it is, however, uh, constructivist learning, which is a good thing, and it's aligned with the next generation science standards, which I, I think must have been appealing in adopting this curriculum. Um, and it comes with a couple of good ideas and, and tools. Uh, I will also say on the positive end that the equipment purchased for it was uh, more than adequate. It's well done by the district. Um, on the negative side, um, I don't know how to put this more plainly, but there really isn't a curriculum. The curriculum is, uh, for each of the units, is essentially a 100-odd slide PowerPoint show that is given to the teachers. There's a concluding test at the end and a couple of quizzes. Um, in the slides are identified some labs we should do, but there are no written instructions for students and no written instructions for teachers. There's not even a website to particularly go to. Wow, that's really fast. Okay, so um, quickly in my last minute, even the slides are poorly written and full of misspellings. Um, there are not enough hands-on activities. Um, there's no support for differentiation among students. Uh, my special ed students, a few of them have actually had panic attacks in class when they see what's going on. And my TAG students are, have reported to be extremely bored. Um, we need help. Uh, there's very little physics in this class. I have a longer list, but I'm a slow talker. So um, I implore you, please speak to the teaching and learning people. Um, this was not rolled out with much thought. Even the next unit, that I, or the unit that I started this last week before Thanksgiving, was not even available online, the materials, until two days before we started. I couldn't even look at it. Um, so please ask them to support this, uh, this new course or, or get rid of it, one or the other. But right now, it's untenable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Roseanne and Karen, I'd like to ask the board office to ask uh, staff for an explanation of the shift from Foundations of Physics and Chemistry to this Patterns Physics curriculum um, so that we can better understand the reasons for the adoption and address some of your concerns about the curriculum. I, as a parent, had a, almost had a panic attack on back to school night with Patterns Physics, <laughs> so I can appreciate what you're saying. My name is Leslie Waldo, W-A-L-D-O-W, -W, and I actually came to the board tonight to exercise my right to talk to you about special education. I've appreciated the comments already by presenters to lean into equity, to lean into inclusion, and to lean into privilege. As a person of the dominant culture, this has not been a place that I have had to go. 
but I am being asked to go there now to advocate for my nephew, who is five years old, in this little picture here, who has disabilities. He is a SPED kid. He has been denied, blatantly denied transportation by this district. This district has told him his disabilities don't matter. He can get to school like everybody else. He's five. He has cerebral palsy. He utilizes an AFO to walk and ambulate every day. He utilizes a special car seat. At five years old, he weighs enough to be in no car seat. But because of his CP and his disabilities, he utilizes a car seat every day in every car. He has epilepsy. He has had epilepsy for three years and has uncontrolled seizures. He is in a seizure activity every day, 24 hours a day. He has a paraeducator assigned to him when he's able to make it to school because he can have a seizure. And his seizure has a protocol that demands monitoring and timing to administer a medication to him in three minutes or less. Three minutes. That's the time we're allowed to talk tonight. Three minutes once his symptoms start to watch him, to document, and to be able to administer that. That takes a trained person. So to say my child and my nephew is not unique and that his disabilities don't matter is offensive and disgusting to me as a co-parent. We've asked for transportation and they say he can get there the way other children can. Last I checked, my neighborhood parents are not all trained in his seizure protocol. They do not carry a go bag with them. They do not have car seats in their car with which to transport a disabled child. Couple all of this with his new diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder that's going to require monthly infusions of immunogamma globulins to support him in being able to be safe. He is not immunized against any disease that we all are. We take it for granted in this culture that vaccines protect us. They didn't protect him. So placing him even in this environment jeopardizes his health and his well-being. So we hope this treatment will help him. He's also asthmatic and with a lung disease. He does a nebulizer every day. He is five years old. I have never, as a dominant culture person, had to lean into this much discomfort to advocate for the equity inclusion of people in a minority group, a minority group of the dominant culture. I can only imagine what my counterparts of different races and ethnicities are you. experiencing. Thank you for your comments. I may also ask if uh, Judy Martin, the ombudsman, maybe can uh, assist you. She's in the back of the room. We've reached out to a lot of okay. places. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and offering your comments on a really diverse set of topics. Um, Next, I'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Guerrero for um, a superintendent report. Well, good evening, everybody. Buenas tardes. Um, and thank you also for the Jefferson team hosting us this evening. Uh, it's good to be out at schools. Well, we thought it'd be a great idea if we had a chance to hear what the superintendent's been up to for a few minutes at every regular board meeting. So I wanted to share a few thoughts. Um, and I want to start off by saying I hope everybody um, had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I did send out a message. I hope uh, most of you had a chance to receive. I'll, I'll just extrapolate a sentence there around what I'm grateful for, and that's to have landed in a school district and in a city that cares deeply and passionately, uh, and I think we've heard that tonight, about its public schools and the education of all its children. Um, and my message goes on to thank our educators and support staff and families for that. Um, we take this responsibility seriously. Our families entrust us and place their faith on us to, to teach their children. And um, we're thankful for the opportunity to do that kind of work. Um, I hope everybody had the opportunity to spend time with family and uh, friends and get a little rest. Um, we know everybody's been working very hard. So there's a few topic areas I was hoping to speak to briefly. Um, I want to start off with some of our health and safety work. Uh, 
I want to share out that we're up to about eight schools at this point with safe and working drinking fountains uh, and probably another three by the end of the week. Uh, once we have our first 15 schools up and running, we'll, we'll assess what other further changes we need to make uh, as we bring on and start work on the next 15 schools. Uh, we're going to maintain our aggressive goal of making sure all of our school facilities have uh, safe water drinking fixtures by the last day of school. Uh, this is in addition to all of the ongoing bond funded work to remediate the radon, the asbestos, and the lead based paint, which also continues in earnest. Uh, the health and safety of our students is our foremost concern. Uh, this is why I was deeply concerned, as probably many of you were, uh, reading the newspaper uh, this weekend. Uh, we had a case where uh, we had a five-year-old student with special needs who, unfortunately, uh, was not safely delivered home. Um, very concerning. It's, it's definitely provoking us to look at our policies and our practices. Uh, one time is one time too many uh, for something like that to happen. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mother for welcoming me into her home uh, over the holiday weekend to have an opportunity to talk about uh, this incident and what happened and how we might be able to avoid that uh, for other families in the future. Inclusive practices. Um, one of the things that, that I heard clearly resonating as Portland Public Schools sought a leader was that it had a, a commitment to equity, that it wanted to uh, work towards providing the most inclusive experience possible uh, for all of his students. And uh, that's going to be a journey. Uh, and we have a lot of work that, that remains uh, to happen there. Um, I want to acknowledge that we've had speakers at the last several meetings, and I have received messages that I want to make sure we're very transparent in our response to around things like making sure that we have adequate staffing levels for caseloads of students. Um, had a very good conversation today with PAT leadership today about that topic and have authorized a little bit more staffing to see where we can alleviate that load, so stay tuned for more there. I also wanted to take the occasion to share a um, plan for another significant change to one of our uh, programs that serves some of our most severe special needs students, and that's the Pioneer uh, program. Uh, earlier today, I joined our special education staff um, and had the opportunity to address, along with our principal there, uh, the faculty, uh, to announce a plan um, to take the, 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 the number of students that are there and to seek out a, a more supportive facility. Uh, we have about 55 elementary students uh, in a building that houses potentially up to 400, um, and we have a nearby campus uh, that makes for a better setting. So we're going to be continuing to communicate with our families and make sure that our students uh, uh, end up in a situation where all those supports and interventions that they deserve are made available to them. At the same time, we have a small number of secondary students at the middle and high school level at the Pioneer Program who we want to ensure that they also have equitable opportunities to engage and interact with their gen ed peers and that they also have all the safety net supports and interventions um, in their neighborhood schools. So we're going to be working with families uh, there as well. Uh, the idea is that all of the support staff will, will follow our students and that as we've gone into our conversation about around middle school redesign that one thing that's clear is our secondary schools need to do a better job of providing a fuller continuum of services and interventions for, for all of our students. Uh, this is going to afford us the opportunity to enhance the staffing um, at many of our campuses and to think about uh, what further um, capacities we need to improve on there as well. Um, I want to share that the elementary students from the Pioneer program will, will be moving over to the Applegate School. Uh, we're going to work with our families who are presently situated there in the Head Start program around um, where we intend to open up more seats uh, in surrounding areas as well. So stay tuned for more details there. Um, I want to mention a little bit about um, the leadership organization structure uh, in PPS. Uh, there's been a lot of conjecture in the media around some of the changes that I've initiated in senior leadership, and there's been a lot of conjecture about that. Um, and I just want to say the only constant that folks should expect is transformation. Um, these changes are intended to build a team that, that I feel is going to allow PPS uh, to get to the next level in our work. And so stay tuned. Um, you know, we're going to continue to make some shifts as appropriate over the course of time. Um, so stay tuned. 
Um, a word on some of the internal and external work, um, as I think I share, and if you're following uh, my Twitter account, um, I try to, get, try to get out to as many schools as possible during the course of, of any given week to interact with students, teachers, administrators, and families, and continue to get um, as acquainted as possible with the district. Um, I have intended to try to put a, a focus on our historically underserved schools uh, as a priority. Had an opportunity to do that again uh, just the week before the break and it's obvious uh, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that equitable opportunities are being provided uh, to all of our students no, no matter which which campus they they walk aboard on um, our key our key core mission to ensure that educational mission uh, is, is our charge and so I can I, I intend and plan to continue to work with our senior leadership team to help ensure that all of our schools have the equitable supports they need to offer the kind of programming that we all want to see and that we want to be proud of. Last night I had another occasion to be at Roosevelt High School, uh, this time uh, in support of uh, House Speaker Kotex uh, meeting with the community uh, around safe routes to school and a 1.5 million grant that she's directing to try to make an area that has suffered some fatalities and accidents, some involving our students, um, to see how we might brainstorm safer routes to school and I want to thank her for, for that effort. Uh, yesterday mor morning I had an opportunity to meet with the various Portland Community College presidents uh, to talk about how we continue to strengthen our working relationship, especially as we think about and dream about expanding our CTE programming uh, in connection with PCC. Uh, our board chair and I had a chance to meet with the mayor yesterday. I think we had a pretty productive conversation uh, in a number of areas. Uh, one of those is that we're certainly hoping for the city's uh, cooperation um, and help as we work on permitting you know, a revitalized Tubman and other buildings that require renovations and where we want to see smooth and efficient permitting happening and we're really happy with the response that we got there. I also had a chance to, to speak uh, briefly in front of the Portland Business Association. Uh, I had a chance to share a little bit about my own vision for Portland Public Schools and our commitment to preparing our graduates to enter the workforce that many of them represent. Um, and I look forward to continuing to build on that relationship and creating new partnerships. Um, I also had a chance to um, introduce them to my first new hire, a director of strategic partnerships. His name is Jonathan Garcia. He's not present in the room because as we see, as we're, as we're sitting here, uh, he's receiving Forbes 30 Under 30 Award in Education, so I just want to congratulate Jonathan on that award. And then um, some further good Portland Public School news. Um, I want to end by uh, reminding all of us that PPS turns out some pretty remarkable graduates, and one of them in particular is a gentleman named J.T. Flowers. J.T. was raised in Albina, went to high school at Lincoln, um, he would say he maybe wasn't the best student, uh, and yet he was accepted to Yale. Uh, he got a chance to work for U.S. Representative Earl Blumenauer, and just this month was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship. He begins his studies at Oxford uh, this coming fall. Uh, my hat's off to, to JT and everyone at PPS, all the educators, teachers that had a chance to work with JT for making this journey and this dream possible for him. So, directors, that concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Superintendent Guerrero. Um, having seen your schedule, I know that that's just the highlights. Um, you've been busy, and um, I know the school community really appreciates um, seeing you out in the schools and being able to hear firsthand from parents, uh, teachers, and staff members, because um, it makes all of our work better. So thank you, thank you for your hard work. Um, next on the agenda, um, we're, I'm just going to briefly summarize some work that's been underway um, at the board level. Um, I think it's fair to say that the board, since um, we the, the Doom board um, sort of was installed on July 1st, we've been in a sprint mode, um, hiring a superintendent, um, supporting the opening of new schools, health and safety work underway, um, establishing new ways of working as a board. Um, and it's kind of time, I think, probably for us to shift from the sprint to more of a middle distance pace. Um, so uh, on November 17th, and I don't know, Brian, do you have the PowerPoint up? Okay. Sorry. 
That's okay. Um, so on November 17th, the board and the superintendent, I think for the first time um, since we um, have been sort of a leadership unit, um, spent a fair amount of time um, working together on, um, on our, talking about our work and our governance and our shared leadership and um, not only what we wanted to accomplish this year, but also how we wanted to, to do it. Um, it's a clicker. There we go. Um, so we spent some time talking about the work over the last three to four months that we've done, um, a little bit about the sprint, and then we talked about our work ahead. We covered um, not only what um, our sort of our thinking and um, with the board, with the superintendent, about the superintendent's goals, um, sort of the metrics for the work. And we also talked about the, the board's work uh, for this year and how we're going to work together as a board um, because how we move the work is really going to be as a team, um, not just the board as a team, but also with the superintendent, by extension, all the senior staff. Um, so we had a great discussion. We, um, it's a little bit of delay here. What, one of the key topics that we covered is one of the most important roles of the school board is um, to hire a superintendent and to engage in sort of the ongoing, the sort of co-creation of the goal setting for the superintendent and this evaluation. So um, in concert with Superintendent Guerrero, we talked about um, the goals for uh, Superintendent Guerrero this year. Um, 2017 is gonna be a little bit different since it's going to be just a partial year, um, I think. Uh, we're being realistic about what can be accomplished in um, sort of being hired, onboarded, and then um, starting the work. Um, but we talked about, you know, early on really creating a clear template of sort of expectations around the key work of the superintendent. And um, we used a template that the Oregon School Boards Association and the Oregon um, and the American Association of Administrators um, recommends and it's really around 11 standards, and they're up on, on the um, PowerPoint up here of what sort of are the key roles of the superintendent. Um, so, you know, at the end of the year, uh, well, throughout the year, and then at the end of the year, looking at, um, you know, how the superintendent's worked matched up against these 11 standards. Um, we also are in an ongoing discussion about sort of four focus goal areas uh, for the superintendent, and then one sort of career development um, goal that the superintendent will identify that he's gonna work on this year. Um, so we have, a, we have a framework for the superintendent's goals and evaluations, and um, on December 5th, next week after our board meeting, we'll have a, a work session where we um, sort of further refine this. So, so what's good for the superintendent is also good for the board. Um, so as the elected leadership of Portland Public Schools, the board also should engage in sort of goal setting and an evaluation of its work, both what it's doing and how we're going to, to work. So um, at our last work session, um, it was recommended by the chief um, HR officer um, that we undertake an evaluation of the board, so where we are right now, get a, get a benchmark for our work ahead. Um, so just like the superintendent, we um, are also going to be utilizing a, a tool and a template from the Oregon School Boards Association to do a self-evaluation so we get a benchmark. Um, again, there's 11 standards. Um, they're different. Um, obviously, the, the board's work is different from the superintendent's work. So. Um, we'll be focusing on the 11 standards that are best practices of what um, school boards should be doing. And um, we will be taking our work and sort of aligning it with um, the superintendent's work so that we have a combined, um, integrated and aligned leadership team, but we're both um, identified what our appropriate roles are and um, how we're gonna measure that at the end of the year. So to set up a scorecard um, for this, sort of first year of work. So in addition to the superintendents and the board's sort of self-evaluation and goals, um, we also um, 
know that one of the things that we've identified as as a as a district leadership is that we need a, um, a strategic plan. Um, the reality is that that is a sort of longer term project, and we need you know we've got work underway right now. So we're going to be developing work plans. Um, all the committees, um, the board committees are um, hard at work. Uh, and we need to sort of align those work plans between the board and the staff and the superintendent. Um, in addition, another piece of the work that um, the board is going to undertake. So first piece of the work plans is kind of the, the what of the work, and the other piece is the how. So um, one of the things that I think the, this board is committed to is that we're going to um, be be operating in the appropriate governance role that is um, assigned to the, to the board, um, which is different from the superintendent and the staff. Um, there's currently a set of board operating protocols that were created a couple of years ago. There was another one um, that was sort of further developed off that. We're going to take those as sort of the baseline and um, create um, it's set operating protocols about how we work um, both with, e we with each other as a board, but also with the superintendent and the staff um, so that we have, um, are operating really at a high, high level in the governance and as, as a team. And so um, that's the work that we started on the 17th and will be as a board continuing over the next uh, month and a half um, to further refine um, both the superintendent's goals and evaluations, but also our own as a board and also our work plan. So uh, just so the community knows, um, we are kind of shifting out of the sprint mode and now into sort of the, you know, a, a different pace of the work to um, focus on sort of our longer term, longer term plans um, and, you know, keeping in mind all the while that um, the students are at the center of our work and that we need to be aligning behind that. Um, so that's sort of a preview of what we are going to be doing as a board probably at, in terms of our governance over the next couple months along with the superintendent. That's it. So next um, we're going to continue on a topic that's been um, sort of at the center of our agendas for the last um, several months and that's um, the prioritized work of both the board, the superintendent, and the school district on the opening of two new middle schools next fall. Um, to recap, the board has voted to open Roseway Heights and Harriet Tubman Middle Schools next fall, providing more than 1,000 students with an opportunity to have an enhanced and equitable middle grades experience. Based on a recommendation from the superintendent and staff, we have designated feeder patterns and some boundary adjustments for these new middle schools. Tonight, we'll be continuing through those items requiring board that require board action um, that are needed actions to support the opening of the two schools. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Guerrero to um, introduce the next couple items that we have tonight related to middle schools. Thank you, Board Chair. Um, well, middle schools have been a big topic. Uh, certainly, board committees have been diving into the details, and this is an opportunity for us uh, for the broader public's benefit to, to also summarize some of those as well. Um, one, one of the big areas is around the resourcing of how we're gonna budget for these two schools that we're launching uh, to be able to do that successfully and our plans for implementing that and for resourcing it. So I wanna invite up our Chief Financial Officer May Lee to come up and begin to, uh, and any other staff team that are, that are gonna be filling in the details as well. Um, to begin to walk us through um, our best thinking. Good evening. Good evening. So um, just wanted to kind of give the board an update in terms of the uh, middle school middle school's implementation project cost estimate. Um, the last time the uh, budget that we look at uh, was a quite a few months ago and uh, since then we have put together a more up-to-date um, budget in terms of what we need to open up those um, sc middle schools and um, the amount actually has um, actually doubled and we were uh, fortunately we were able to find existing resources to fund this project and um, 
uh, most of the funding will be coming from the construction excise tax fund and um, and the um, about 12.6 million is coming from that fund and uh, another 5.45 is uh, band compens uh, bond compensable amount that will be coming from the 2017 bond. And the rest is actually based on our existing uh, budget amount for current year and uh, next year as well. So I um, wanted to uh, give that, uh, provide that update to the board and see if there's any um, questions. I want to say this is one of the benefits of all the cranes that we see around Portland. We have been able to build up a pretty good kitty in our construction excise tax mm -hmm. as a result of all the local development, and this is exactly what those funds are intended for, capital right. investments, and in particular, capital investments on new buildings and um, in major improvements, so we're we're in a, a lucky spot yes. to be able to go to that, and it also to the taxpayers for funding the bond, which takes some pressure off um, other projects that might have had to go to that fund. So, the question: How much um, annually are we bringing in from the construction excise tax, and how much will this be? Um, what will we have left over? Once, if, once we vote to utilize these funds? So we actually have a uh, plan out in terms of exactly what we need for the next couple years. And uh, annually we receive about 6.55 million uh, related to this uh, CET fund. So, um, and currently the balance of the fund is actually about 18 million. So we have more than sufficient to fund the middle school uh, project. It's been doubling over the last like three years or something and mm -hmm. is expected to continue to grow for at least the next two to three yes. significantly, yes. right? Assuming our, uh, our growth continues in the, uh, in the area and the construction also continue. Uh, so, Director Bailey, did you have a question? So is now the time to dig into the detailed spreadsheet? I, I think we can. I think just for general public, uh, just in summary, uh, we, we came to the board with a revised figure. This is about $20.5 million in resources that are going to get dedicated to this. You know, about $7 million really to address bringing Tubman mm -hmm. um, with a new roof, HVAC, et cetera, fire safety mm -hmm. sprinkler, um, some contingency funds, and then the cost of relocating programs, programs that are being displaced, other school buildings that need to be renovated in this. And so um, our board, and I think has been posted, is a more itemized budget list, and mm -hmm. I think this is what Director Bailey wants to start to dive into. So we have staff available. Dive in. And, and we also have gone through the, uh, the file, the detailed file, with our FAO committee members last week. And uh, we also had some follow-up questions. And we answered, um, I believe we answered all of them. I don't want to speak on the entire staff. We have some lingering questions. And, and I wanted to make also make sure that um, when we put our estimate uh, together, we are putting in, uh, we are using the best estimate that we know uh, at, at, that on, at that point. So as you know, in any type of veneration or um, reconstruction projects, sometimes you find out more information or, um, in terms of what is needed. So we'll continue to update the uh, the project costs and make sure that we have sufficient funding for the project. Okay, um, I'll just start start with a couple, jump in. Um, start with what I hope is an easier one first. Uh, there's no, uh, money to help uh, with the formation of the two new middle schools, you know, forming site councils and uh, student engagement and so on. Is Rose City Park as a new school also included in, uh, in that for receiving as, as, uh, assistance? Yes. Okay, they weren't called out specifically, so I wanted to make sure oh, that okay. they were, that was part of the planning? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. Keep going. Uh, keep going. Uh, um, and 
so there's different references to access. How much is anticipated in terms of actually moving access to a new location? So we actually have um, put together an estimate about um, $3 million altogether in terms of the, uh, the move and the reopening of uh, um, Rose City Park. Okay, so a lot of that is retrofitting Rose City Park, like for accessibility and some safety issues. Right. How much is actually moving access? So we are looking at, at different locations right now. So mm -hmm. the estimate right now is about a million dollars in terms of reconfigurating all the uh, classrooms. Okay. So just to clarify, uh, Director Bailey, you're, you're right. It's about three million to cover a number of associated costs for access specifically, given we were exploring possibilities. Look like we may be situating the program on a, on a relatively uh, ready to go campus with some some modifications so there's half million to a million set aside to be able to do that and work with the school community yes. meeting its programming needs there okay the new science labs are roughly a quarter million per lab I believe and you should, For you should feel free if you want to have somebody else come up and answer something yeah. like that. <laughs> List. Since when is the staff shy? Come on up. The price Come on, is Jerry. Right. I was trying to kick him under the table. No. <laughs> um, actually, I think, I think that cost has gone up to closer to about 330000 per. Yeah. So the, the, the numbers we're using for the science labs are the, and May says estimate to you, and I don't say estimate because we have no architect. We haven't drawn anything. It's a budget. Understood. Estimate is when we can actually have something we can estimate off of. So it's the budget, and what we use for the science budget is the dollar we use per square foot for all the science lab conversions we did for the 2012 bond. We thought that was as solid as we had, plus a little bit of escalation factor on it. So that's where the 300,000 number comes from. Some of these um, are not going to be as intense as the ones we did in the bond, but some are, so that was an on average figure. Uh, so, uh, and I apologize, I should have started by saying, Thank you to all the staff for putting together a very detailed budget. And, and I appreciate that it's best figures going and we'll, we'll get refinements going down, so uh, understood. Um, what exactly are we getting in those science labs? Uh, some of the feedback from the 2012 bond science labs were, well, we got a sink and a couple extra sets of plugs. What, 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 <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. Okay. Um, what's, what's that actually going to look like at the middle school level? What will those labs be equipped with? So, uh, so every room got like forty or fifty thousand dollars of furniture in each one. We redid some of the countertops. If they were laminate before, they got switched out to epoxy countertop. Um, some of the ventilation systems and hood systems and the intake and the vents uh, were changed out. We put um, in some of them either isolated grounds or uh, GFCI or dedicated circuits. Um, more to it, but okay, and, and, and uh, ADA compliant on the science sink, and I believe we also added the emergency eye wash station as well, but okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. The uh, hazmat consulting and abatement at both middle schools, is that just going in and giving a kind of a once over in terms of possible risks there? Sorry. I saw, I saw Hasman, I thought white suit. Well, people, uh, and maybe. Know. And maybe. So, what you have to do is we look at a couple of things when you're putting a conceptual budget together. We look at what we know is already removed from the site, what may be left, what might be disturbed through a scope of work that hasn't been fully determined yet, and what a rough dollar per square foot is to go and do that work if it's hot, and then a part of it if it's not hot. And that's how you come together with that number. Can I jump in? Please. Um, so just looking through here, I'm, 
it looks like there's a, a lot of things being added to the middle schools. Um, I guess I have a more sort of like larger overarching question is, you know, one of the reasons why we're reconfiguring is so that there's equitable offerings. And it sounds like um, they'll have real science labs. Um, but are we also looking at um, the type of electives that might be offered and making sure that, so for example, if if we're going to have music, that we have actually have band instruments, or you know, all the things that would that we're wanting students to have because it will be equitable to what other um, well-resourced middle schools have, just in terms of the sort of the richness and diversity of offerings. Are we are we providing that? Is that built into this? There's a lump sum for uh, curricular resources and programming resources and uh, professional development resources. I believe it's $200,000 um, for each school just for the kind of program resources plus another $200,000 for each school for the PD. Um, I'm sorry, I was looking for our lead, uh, our interim senior director for um, uh, instruction and curriculum. So I'm speaking a little bit off the cuff. But um, in addition to that, um, I know that there's um, allocation for um, some, of the, some of the special program offering um, around uh, if we happen to implement the IB program, if we happen to um, do additional resources around uh, media and library, um, there's significant resources around uh, digital learning um, being allocated for as well. But I don't know specifically about band instruments, yeah, I'll so confess. I guess what <laughs> really intentional about what it is that we're offering because I think if you told us well we have the summer mm -hmm. money and we, we had to choose between textbooks um, and science lab equipment and say band uniform band instruments and um, other things that uh, might be necessary for um, electives that the board would much rather know know now that like and re, and resource it now versus down the road saying well we made a trade off and we bought the textbooks and not the other things so we uh, I think we want to make sure that we are resourcing these schools in a way that kids are going to get what what I think they believe has been promised to them what we think we're giving them but just I want to make sure that that's all in here. I think that's the yep. right question, Chairman Edwards. Yep. I think we're all operating with that. Uh, guiding question in mind is to make sure that we offer as full a complement even in year one uh, in each of these schools and again these these are our best estimates as we work with our planning principles we're getting much more detailed about what it's going to actually take and our senior director Brenda Fox can speak a little bit about how that process is coming along to make sure that we're not having to make those kinds of hard trade-offs and not affording our students all of those kinds of offerings well and I also want to comment that those are the discussions in that yes, we'll and that's another place. Correct. Yeah. So as far as the band instruments go, our first, um, our first glance at that was, what do we already have in the district that might not be used in other schools? Are we, um, do we have a continuum of music classes that support band? And if instruments are in the elementary schools, is that the right place for them? So that's where we started looking. And that is also informing some of the scope and sequence work in the arts that will occur this summer. Um, so a shorter answer to you is no, the band instruments are not in the current budget, but they are in the budget that our Arts TOSA is putting forward for this next year. So separate from the middle school budget, but in our budgeting process. And part, of the, sorry, part of that process that's underway is the um, sort of evaluation of the alignment between the offerings in the feeder schools through the to the middle schools into the high schools to which they feed to make sure that they all articulate correct our planning principals have been meeting with the feeder principals from each of the schools that will become part of their school population and they've talked about what programs are in place that they will need to continue into middle school um, and not just the academic programs, but also um, other traditions and things that go with the elementary schools are part of their planning process. And then they're talking with the high school principals that they will eventually feed to to make sure that our course offerings are in alignment with what's offered at the high school and also that we don't offer courses that the high school is going to offer and that might um, 
might jeopardize the high school program because they won't have kids that will forecast into those because we've offered them at the middle school. So we're really trying to get that um, pre-K through 12 glimpse at where the middle school program should fit. So I think going forward in, um, for a sustainable budget, um, I think it would be a good idea to have a line item for instrument replenishment. Um, I see also there's maker spaces uh, being created at each school. We know at the high schools now that teachers are scrambling for scraps to use uh, in those kind of classes. Uh, is there, will there be a sustainable budget item for supplying, uh, you know, just the throughput that's needed for those classes? Again, I don't expect yeah. answers like that, but mm -hmm. looking ahead to our budget coming this year, mm -hmm. we, we have to think about that. Um, I, I, I want our teachers teaching and not you know, going through scrap yards. I'm glad to hear that Director Bailey is thinking like some of our teachers might be, not just you know, do I have the core curriculum materials I need, but also the annual consumable material that you know, has to be part of the problem. I think we heard public testimony earlier. We have work to do in a lot of our content areas to, to ensure you know, that core curriculum is, is available and a scope and sequence is available. Uh, but we certainly want to launch these schools with, with what they need to get started. And I agree, part of our annual budgeting process should account for those kinds of consumables and other materials across all of our middle schools, for right. sure. And, and high school CTE as well. And, and high school CTE mm -hmm. as well. And, um, like Director Moore, who raised the issue in an email, I'm looking forward to further clarification on the community involvement uh, budget and what, uh, what, what that will involve. Again, that's not something I need to know tonight, but going forward. Unless, unless you want to. You might have additional questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down this end of the board and we can always come back. So, any, Moses. Director Comstam or Director Anthony? My questions have been addressed. Ms. Lee, I did want to ask, uh, you had sent a memo to the board earlier today. Uh, $500,000 each spent on two different sites. Can you tell us what the sites are? That was not real clear. What are you referring this to? This is related to the excess, I think. What? Well, can you you are, what you are referring you're referring to the email I replied to? The, um, yes. Excess move work one million dollars. Classroom rework at site X five hundred thousand. Classroom rework at site Y five hundred thousand. Uh, so, so I, yes. I think um, maybe last month or the month before when we had the board meeting, we were talking about access and, and the location, and we, were, we haven't decided um, the location yet. So um, when we did the budget, we were looking at potentially two locations. That's why we have 500,000 twice. Ah, okay. Thank you. That, w that was one alternative I, I was wondering about it, but okay. thank you. Great. But that's Good. not the, so I'm assuming if we don't need the 500,000 that y it'll just be wrapped into something else. I think I was trying to get at that earlier when I said, you know, initially there was the million budgeted, but we know at this point that the site we're looking at would, would be one site, right. and it would be somewhere between the 500 and the million once we get in there and, and look at what kind of work needs needs to be done. Right. And um, sorry to dance around the not naming the site specifically, but honestly, I'm just trying to be sensitive to the impacted school communities and families that we want an opportunity to continue to work through our communications with. but. Uh, an announcement will be pending shortly for access. Uh, just, a, just a couple things. Um, I asked a great many questions at the committee, so most of my questions have already been answered. Um, um, so first of all, thank you for this. There is, this is a, this is a pretty big spreadsheet, and I know Underneath this, there are many, many more spreadsheets. So 
Um, this is really this is really helpful. So thank you for pulling it all together. Um, I I do have two lingering questions, and um, one is about the community outreach, and um, I I don't. I don't need to get it tonight, but um, I do want to get some. I do want to get clarity about what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing it. And if you can answer tonight, that would be great. If you can't, then. Right. Sorry, right when you were asking the question, I was getting another question asked so me over here. So th this is about the community engagement budget, the 191,000. Yeah. Okay, so um, approximately half of that has already been encumbered through the work that we did with Education Northwest um, that uh, involved, you know, considerable um, research, uh, writing, and, and other things that produced that volume that we used and, and several iterations of that that were also translated. And uh, the combined total of that was close to $90,000. The remain so are you talking are you talking about what what document are we talking about the document that we had that had all the scattergrams in it and the detailed feeder patterns and so it was during the the dis initial discussions yeah about feeder form. patterns yeah okay, okay. The, and all the materials that went into that uh, translations etc et the printing you know and so forth okay so that's what a, a large amount of that is for um, we're anticipating, uh, you know, a number of community engagement sessions going forward, and those each cost somewhere to two thousand dollars or upwards, and there could be dozens, uh, depending on you know what the needs are. Um, we've basically um, kind of pledged to help the planning principals do everything they can to. Uh, incorporate community feedback into their work and to make, make sure that the community is engaged. Um, we're also holding out the possibility of, uh, I think this was discussed before, of potentially a campaign manager to just oversee the whole stri strategic um, uh, oversight of this, the, the communications and making sure that deadlines are met and, and so forth. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen, but it is, it, it is something that um, uh, some are advocating for and we're you know kind of keeping our our options open there just to give a little example uh, for instance with the Tubman school community uh, I was out there with staff uh, a week or two ago meeting with the community around what is the best way that you might suggest that we engage with you as we go about this planning and in what way do you want to be engaged and they were very clear <laughs> in all aspects and very specifically and so we're coming but we're circling back to the community there around here are the various committees and here's how often uh, we intend to, to sit down and kind of share our progress along the way but every one of those gatherings requires support um, we heard from parents there clearly they want translation so they can be fully in engage and have access to the conversation so that's an intention of ours to be able to do that but we want we want to do the program design as thoughtfully as possible with their input and you know that's going to take some time and effort and certainly resources to support it my question um, Linda, is like when do the materials need to be ordered so when do the decisions made in terms of what the curriculum will look like how what's the timeline um, February to March in that time frame. The decisions will be made as they need to be so that we can order the materials right. and have them delivered in plenty of time that okay. should there even be any chance of error in the materials that we have time to rectify that before teachers need them for their students. Okay. So that gives us basically January, February to have those community meetings in order to determine um, what that curriculum is going to look like in each of the schools. Correct. Okay. Well, okay. Gives me a much better sense. And we, and we have plans for doing that. Okay. Um, each of the directors in curriculum and instruction are on deck to go out and right. provide information se sessions to um, the families at Harriet okay. Tubman, Roseway Heights, and at Ockley Green to talk about what our curriculum is and where they see their students as learners within that curriculum. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, Director Bailey? 
One more. Um, just a footnote on the CET fund. Um, there, there was sort of a campaign promise made in the 2012 bond for uh, the our friends in the business community raised the point of, hey, you're going to build these new schools, and are you going to half maintain them like you do everything else? And the kind of pledge was made that the CET fund would be a source of ensuring that as our new schools came online, they were well maintained. Um, it's so as as we think about that going forward, how are we budgeting for that fund in terms of maintaining our new schools as they come online? So we actually have um, I already have a budget uh, put together in terms of the CET fund and uh, in terms of uh, providing the improvement of the facilities at the, our schools. Okay. And I think also there's a, Jerry could speak to it more fully, but there's a subset of our funds that come in from the construction excise tax that's set aside for our, um, it's called Capital Asset Renewal Fund, which is only dedicated to the terms you okay. just described, which is new facilities or facilities that have had significant capital improvements. So that's, those are, de those are segregated funds. And do you know offhand how much that is? The Capital Asset Renewal Fund uh, now, Jerry? Yeah, but okay, do, great. do you Thanks. know what, uh, does anybody know what proportion of the CET revenue coming in is dedicated to the capital, uh, what is it, the capital asset, asset renewal. renewal? So the restricted portion of the CET fund is actually funding the uh, capital assets uh, fund uh, renewal plan. So um, the question that uh, you were asking uh, in the FAO committee Right. It's actually uh, related to the restrictions. It's related for this uh, CAF plan. Yeah, I don't know what the percentage of that is, but. Um. So the um, beginning balance of the restricted portion of the CET fund is about uh, $10 million out of the uh, 18 million. The whole thing is 18, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> So that but will remain going forward. We will continue to use that, use those funds to support the maintenance. Yes, and um, is basic. There, there was a uh, board uh, resolution uh, back in 2012 that set up the 20-year plan of the, the the CAF plan for that purpose. Okay. And read it. Maybe something that we want to revisit in FAO in terms of the um, proportion of that money that we want to put into that, because of course the eligible expenses for the capital asset renewal fund are growing as we bring our new right. schools online. Right. So I think these are great points that our directors are raising. I mean, oftentimes school systems, when they find themselves with constrained resources, will tighten the belt on deferred maintenance, for example, right. knowing we have a fund available right. where. Our educators and our principals bring it up all the time, and I've seen it myself. There are areas that we need to sort of remedy, and I know nothing would make facilities happier than to hear the board say, let's dedicate X amount to circling back to that work list, because there is a punch list out there of things mm -hmm. that we want to make sure our buildings are not just safe, but attractive environments for yeah. our teachers and our students. We also have new technology to take care of and different types of environments. Director Comstam, I found my information here. So about the six million of CET that comes in, 4.5 is unrestricted and 1.5 is restricted for the very things that Director Bailey was talking about. Great, thanks, Jerry. And, and just to clarify, so, so these restrictions were placed on this money by us, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Director Rosen or Moses, any questions? I don't have any further questions. I just wanted to say thanks for all the information, not only at, at the facilities audit and operations committee, but also through all the emails we were getting as follow up. Uh, can I ask one more question? Um, and I don't know that anybody sitting there now can answer this, but I'll ask it. Um, on the list here, is a budget item for a sun site. And um, 
do we have any any updated information about the status of that request? Conversations have started on the Sun site with Multnomah County, and they um, need the final pieces from us by just well next month. So we're we're working on that to get it to them. So the expectation is that it's going to be just one. Roseway Heights was already a Sun school, so Harry Tubman would be okay. the one that we need to initiate. Okay. So. This is a possibility? Yes, it is. Why don't we give Ms. Janine Fakuda a chance at the mic here to talk about our partnership with Sun and what role they might play in these two schools? Um, we actually, as a placeholder, put in um, a request for two Sun sites. Um, and I believe uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Lopez and the planning principals are going to start very quickly this month engaging with the community to first understand what the needs are from the feeder schools um, and the services that they have at those schools because the majority of those feeder schools are sun sites already. So we believe that there is probably going to be an expectation that both um, are uh, sun sites. So we are waiting. We're going to go through that process. Um, and each of the sun sites will cost, if we fully fund it, 120000 approximately. If we are able to get the county to chip in, it'll be half of that. Um, but all of that needs to be done quickly so that we can engage with the county. They start their budget process in January, so they, they need a commitment or an intent from us to start going through that process. In addition, Ms. Fakuda, would you mind talking about perhaps some of the culturally specific supports that we may want to explore making available there as well? Yes. So along with the before and after school programming, we also want to ensure that we have some culturally specific supports available for historically underserved students and families. So for example, some of the mentoring, uh, tutoring, or other wraparound supports, family engagement that we provide through um, our providers like SEI, NEA, Latino Network, um, ERCO, et cetera, so we are going to be exploring those as well. And we should know by the end of this month what those ser services are, and we can come up with a estimate. And that would be for both? both, for both yes, schools. yes. So I just have a, f a final question. Um, I think this is for Mr. Vincent. Um, so I really appreciate the detailed spreadsheet and the breakdown uh, both of sort of classroom supports, curricular supports, but also the facilities work. And it, um, just looking through the facilities, I guess I, I would ask if, um, if the board approves this, um, we'll have, um, this is back to the health, health and safety issue, full remediation of any radon, asbestos, lead paint, lead in the water. Uh, we'll have a functioning, at a million dollars of functioning and hopefully state-of-the-art sprinkler system or fire sprinkler and $2 million for HVAC. So I just want to make sure that when we move people in, that this is the um, this will cover all the costs to have a safe school. This is the um, finishing off the 25% fire sprinkler alarm, fire alarm that wasn't done when we did the work up before Fabi went in. All those other things have had a series of patching and band-aiding and duct taping and all that's taken care of. It's all removed, it's all new. So it'll yeah. be fully remediated. And then the yes. $2 million that um, we have allocated here for the HVAC system for the air in, in interior air quality, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's state of the art. Um, it's oh, oh, exactly it what we need inside the building. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's the latest HEPA type systems and filter systems. My, what makes that a, a budget number is we have, uh, there's the HVAC for the roof and then the roof its system itself. What we'll do is we'll camera all the duct work and see if the duct work is clean. And uh, there's, there's a possibility around sections of the duct work that need to be removed too. I mean, why put a new system on the roof and have duct work either doesn't close and damper itself off where you can section it off and, and provide different amounts and flow of air, but also why would we want to, you know, why would we go and use dirty duct work? So we'll have the whole thing blown out or we'll have to take part of it or all of it out and replace that as well. So that's, that, that's covered, the part that's that, covered in these resources. Uh, it's, we're going to try to do it in those resources. Right. Thank you. Any other final questions or we can maybe move to um, consider both, both, both items at one time, both the uh, 
um, the budget and the uh, construction excise tax resolution. Any, any other questions? Um, this was in the Finance Audit and Operations Committee. Um, Director Moore, you're the chair of that committee. Um, was there a recommendation on um, the two resolutions, uh, one relating to the excise, excise fund and the other relating to the budget? Yes. Uh, so the first resolution, 5542, is authorizing usage of the construction excise fund. Um, and the committee um, committee recommended approving the resolution. Second resolution, uh, 5543, um, is uh, asking for exemption from competitive bidding in order to do the middle school conversion projects. Um, and um, given the tight timeline, uh, we're going to have to forego competitive bidding in order to get this, to bring this, bring all this home in time for next school year. And the, and the committee recommended um, approving that resolution as well. So unless there's, uh, as we um, had our discussion before we moved it, but I, I would ask uh, that we now consider a resolution number 5542 with, which authorizes the use of the construction excise fund. Do I have a motion? So moved. All second. Director Bailey moves um, and the motion and Director Constam seconds it. Um, Ms. Hewson, is there any public comment on resolution 5542? Is there any further board discussion? This is again, this is the construction excise fund. If not, the board will now vote on resolution 5542. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Student Rep Tran? Yes. Resolution 5542 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative Tran voting yes. Um, let's see. Are we supposed to vote on the budget, the budget too? Sorry. So 5543 is the only other one, correct. Um, so at this point, um, the board is, um, is going to continue its work as the local contract review board. Um, so as background for the community, the board has approved the opening of the two middle schools. Um, Harriet Tubman Middle School in particular needs substantial improvements in health and safety upgrades in order for the school building to be a suitable learning environment for students and staff. Oregon law authorizes the board to exempt certain public improvement contracts from the traditional design, bid, build, competitive procurement process. Staff requests that the Board of Education, acting as the contract review board, approve an exemption from the middle school facility conversion project. Um, as Director Moore indicated, this exemption will allow PPS to expedite the facility's improvement work so that schools will be ready by August 2018. And it's my understanding that if we don't do this, it's very unlikely that we'd have the schools ready uh, for students in the fall of 2018. Um, staff has submitted a very extensive report with the findings about why um, it's necessary for the board acting as the local contracting board um, to um, move ahead um, with an exemption from the competitive bidding process. Um, Superintendent Guerrero, do you have anything you want to add to this particular item? Just that the board support is appreciated on both these items so that the staff can continue at work. Great, well, we want to remove ourselves as an impediment. Um, so, let's see, so now I have to open a public hearing on the, on the competitive, the conversion, middle school conversion project exemption from competitive bidding. Um, Ms. Houston, do we have anyone signed up for public testimony? No one has signed up for public testimony. So I will now close the public hearing on the exemption from competitive bidding and ask the board to consider resolution number 5543, the middle school conversion project exemption from competitive bidding. Do I have a motion? Second. Director Esparza-Brown moves and Director 
more seconds, the motion to adopt resolution 5543. Is there any additional board discussion on this resolution? Uh, we've already heard that uh, the Finance Audit and Operation Committee recommended board approval. Discussion? I just want to say thank you because it is a pretty exhaustive process that staff needs to go through to um, to address all the criteria for the exemption. So it, it makes it easy for us to see that it is, in fact, justified. So thank you. We would want the Board of Ed and the taxpayers to know that we will be competitive in quotes um, in, in any process that we can. It's the competitive bid process that takes right. 90 to 120 days that we're foregoing. We're not just asking someone, what would you do it for? And they throw a number out and we say, sounds good to me. So we still will get quotes and bids and that for the work being done. It's the process. We don't have 120 days to do a process right now. And we also have the benefit of having done a lot of similar work that we can Correct. compare these incoming bids to. Correct. Yeah, okay. I was just going to clarify that very point. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? Okay, the board will now vote on resolution 5543. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Student Representative Tran? Yes. Resolution 5543 is approved by a 7 to 0 vote with Student Representative Tran voting yes. Um, so the board will now reconvene back into its regular meeting. Thank you all for all the work to bring this forward. Thank you all very much. And for all the work they're going to do going forward. Appreciate it. We're now going to shift to board committee and conference reports. Um, and I think um, Director Moore has a Finance Audit and Com Operations Committee report? We kind of just did it. Um, that's what we spent most of our time at the last meeting talking about. Anything on teaching and learning? I think I've reported. Okay. Enrollment and forecasting will be meeting next Monday at 6 o'clock at BESC. I'm not sure which room. Moses, do you have a report? Any, any other um, comments from the for the board? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Teaching and learning will be December twelfth. Thank you. At four thirty. Great. Um, any other board business? So the board will now consider the remainder of its business agenda, having already voted on resolution 5542 and 5543. Was there a report from our student rep? I already asked him, he oh, said no. I'm sorry. Um, board members, are there any items you'd like to pull for a separate discussion and vote? Ms. Hewson, are there any changes to the business agenda? Resolution 5544 has been withdrawn. Agenda. Five, five, four, four, which is it was a policy. What item was that, Miss Houston? That was the authorization to waive policy three point three zero point zero two zero. Yes, thank you for raising that. Um, so. Um, you don't see it in your packet because it was um, never included. Uh, but I want to let board members know that um, at the next board meeting, we will um, have under consideration a temporary waiver of a policy relating to um, sales on school property, which is at the high level. And so that will come to the board this next uh, meeting. And we need to do that because we need to put, um, we need to waive the policy temporarily because we need the time to put in place some procedures um, so that our schools can um, actually up com up comply with our policy. So, fundraising? Um, fundraising, like it's the mattress sales, the okay. the farmers market at um, by Riki. Um, so. 
we had a question from staff about um, compliance with um, the the policy, and it appears that we need to get from staff um, a recommendation of some policies or some just practical frameworks, and um, so that schools can and school communities comply with that. Comply with that. So it wasn't actually in your packet, but but it's coming our way. Um, do I have a motion and a second to adopt the business agenda? So moved. Moved second. by Director Constam, seconded by Director Bailey. Um, Ms. Houston, is there any public comment on the business agenda? <laughs> is there any board discussion on the business agenda? Okay, the board will now vote on the business agenda. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Uh, Student Representative Tran. Yes. The business agenda is approved by a vote of seven to zero with Student Representative Tran voting um, yes. And with that, um, I want to just close the meeting by once again thanking the Jefferson community for hosting us this evening um, and having um, two students really kick off the meeting with a very inspiring and energizing um, welcome to us. So thank you again to the Jefferson community. Um, the meeting is now adjourned. Our next meeting is December 5th. Thank you. Which is a really, really long way of saying we're designing a water sensor to detect coliform and other contaminants in the uh, And we were lucky enough to have uh, get selected. which is a really, really